I'm getting this right. I'm getting old, I guess is what's happening to me. And um, <laughs> I don't know about, you know, but when you get old and you have to take blood pressure medicine, something like that, boy, it just, woo, it makes you, kind of dries you out a little bit and all that. But anyway, glory to God, I'm still around, still kicking and still, <laughs> still going. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hear you, Master. Yeah, y'all remember this right back here. You rock. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. I, may it be so, you know. May that be true is all I can say. Lord, make it true. We're, uh, we're in a series. Uh, we've been in it. This is our fifth week, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. This is the fifth Beatitude we're looking at today. The Beatitudes are uh, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is considered by most to be Jesus' most famous sermon it's certainly the longest that's recorded in the Bible. It lasts a couple of chapters long, and it is filled with, um, it's really been called the constitution of the kingdom of God. It's what the kingdom of God is all about, what it's intended to do. And then the first 12 verses of the Beatitudes, I mean, of the Sermon on the Mount, we call the Beatitudes because it's about attitudes that Jesus had. And he was saying to us, you need to have these same attitudes. And if you will have these same attitudes, you can be happy. Now, I know every one of us in here want to be happy, right? Yeah. You came to church today. You said, uh, I want to be happy. I, I want the Lord to speak to me so that my life can get better, so that I can be a happier person, and I can be more at peace, and I can have some direction in my life. Uh, that's why you, why you came in here today. Well, the Lord knew that the most, um, the most looked-to thing about humanity will be that we will all be looking to be happy. So out of all the subjects that Jesus could have started the, kingdom, the Sermon on the Mount with, he started it with, let me tell you how to be happy. And the reason he did this is because unless he tells us, we won't ever be happy. You know why? Because we look for happiness in all the wrong places. And we look for happiness in all of these things that we can put in our life. And Jesus is going to tell us it doesn't have anything to do with all of these things that you're after. Money, prestige, power, you know, uh, pleasure, all, all of these things. That's not what brings you happiness. What is going to bring you happiness is the attitude that you have on the inside of your heart. Like, like the praise song just said, all my fears and doubts, they can all come too because they can't stay long <laughs> when, when I believe that you're the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, you know, all of those things just dissipate in the presence of God. And so he uses the word uh, markyrios in the Greek, which has been translated in King James and in most other Bibles, uh, blessed are you. Blessed are, you know, the poor in spirit. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are you. But it could just as easily be translated. The word markyrios, which is translated blessed, or if you're Baptist, blessed, you know, <laughs> blessed are you. We seem to say that, blessed. But it could be easily translated happy. Happy, it means happy are you when you're this. Happy are you yeah. when you're that. And, and let's just look at what we've looked at so far, and you can see what I'm talking about. And seeing the multitudes, this is Matthew 5, first verse, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and he, when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed or happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember, the poor in spirit means those who, who, who know their need for God. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. This is not about low self-esteem or putting yourself down or wandering around, you know, humbling yourself by uh, downgrading everything about I'm a worm, I don't deserve it. No, 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 no. Poor in spirit means I recognize that I'm not the highest thing in the universe and I, and I need God in my life. It's really, it's really a, 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 a verse about humbling and about being humble in life and realizing that you're not the, kingdom, the center of the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not those who moan. Uh, mourning, to mourn means legitimate grief. We all have times where we grieve legitimately in life. And God says when you grieve legitimately, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come. He says, for they shall be comforted. The word comforted means I come with strength. In other words, God says when you legitimately mourn in life, 
I'm going to come with strength into your life, and I'm going to take care of what you're mourning about. I'm going to strengthen you so you could be happy. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek means to have your strength under control. And according to verse 5, when it talks about inheriting the earth, it's talking about being under control, having your strength under control, especially when it comes to people. Yeah. So this yeah. deals with, with, with an attitude of power that we all have, but we harness that and we, we let the, we let the it's like a, a wild stallion that could go in every direction, but we put a bridle on it and the rider sits on our back with a bridle and directs us now in which direction we should go. And of course, the rider is Jesus in our life. And so what we do is follow the commands of the rider uh, in our life. And then last week, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That just deals with being satisfied in your soul. And, and, and he says, you're go, you can be satisfied in your soul if you're hungry and thirsty after the right thing. And according to him, the right thing is righteousness. What does righteousness mean? It means rightness. I, I'm hungry and thirsty to be right with God in my life because God's going to fill you up is what he's saying here. You can, you can be satisfied if you're hungry for the right thing. So we talked about not eating spiritual junk food and not chasing the wrong things and so forth. Now today in verse 7, we're talking about mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So obviously this one is about, um, about how to receive mercy in your life. How many of you think you need some mercy? From, uh, yeah, you need some mercy in your life. Well, let me just clue you in. If you don't think you need some, you really do need some mercy in your life. Uh, it's, it's just one of those things that all of us need. I don't know if you've noticed these. You may not have noticed it. But uh, four of these, there are eight of these Beatitudes, and four of them deal with our relationship with God Pure in heart, um, mourn, uh, so far. Um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Those deal with my relationship with God. And then blessed are the meek, you know, who are patient with people. And today, blessed are the merciful. Obviously, those beatitudes deal with our relationship with others, fellow human beings. Yeah. Yeah. So four of them are about God and four of them are about human beings. And so today... It's talking about our relationship with each other. And it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, one thing about being older in life, and, I, and Pastor Tanya and I were talking about this yesterday. We, we talk about it sometimes. Uh, when, when you preach or when you teach, uh, you, you, know, you draw from your experiences. And, of course, being uh, 64 years old, almost right at it, I, I draw from things I heard all of my life and things that were put into me. And I know that sometimes puts me a little bit out of touch with some of you younger people because I reference things that you go, what is he talking about? <laughs> my goodness, what, what, who is that? <laughs> I've never heard of them before. But I was, I was telling Pastor Tan yesterday, I said, you know, I wish that I could get something cur in the current vernacular or the current pop culture, whatever it might be, but I just don't, I don't know any of that stuff because I'm not interested in that. I don't listen to that. I don't watch it on TV. It's just not something. So you just have to put up with my old sayings and stuff like that, all right? I, when I was growing up, my, parent, my, parents would say, my parents would say to me and my grandparents would say, you need to be careful how you act because remember, and here's what they say, you, you get what you give. That was the way they put it. Uh, Keith, be careful how you act because uh, what you do with others, uh, you, you're going you're gonna to have them do you that way. You know, it's kind of like do unto others as you would have them do right. unto you. It was kind of basically the flip side of that. Uh, if whatever you do with them, uh, you're going to get that back again. And so that is de definitely true, especially in the area of mercy. Last week, you know, we talked about hungering and thirsting after righteousness, being hungry for the right things. Well, I talked to you about if your life, if you're trying to fill your life up with spiritual junk food, right? You're, you're seeking uh, things that'll make you happy that are worldly and sinful and, you know, uh, prideful and carnal and all of that. 
that uh, you're going to suffer a law, a spiritual law in this universe, and it was the law of diminishing returns. You remember that? And the law of diminishing returns says anything that is sinful, anything that is against God, anything that is not honored by God, when you do it, you're going to get diminishing returns, which means I'm going to start out up here with my with my response, I, I might, whatever I'm doing might make me feel good, act good, uh, you know, take me out of my, my pain or whatever it might be. But over a period of time, because it doesn't honor God and it's not something God ordains, I'm going to, I'm going to, for the same amount I put in, I'm going to get less return, less, 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 less. And, right, and I have to drink more, I have to shoot more, I have to do whatever it is, I have to, to get the same buzz I had back here because my returns are diminishing like this. And you, you've seen this happen in people's lives, right? This is how people become alcoholics and drug addicts and everything else. This is why they die if, they, if you don't intervene in some way because sooner or later they get to the point where they have to drink so much or shoot so much to get the same buzz that they, they, they put their whole brain to sleep. And when you put the center of your brain to sleep, you don't breathe anymore and your heart doesn't beat anymore and boom, you're gone. That's the law of diminishing returns. Yeah. I want to contrast that today with another law and it's called the law of direct return because that's what, the, this, that's what this beatitude is talking about. The law of direct return says whatever you give, that's what you're going to get. Jesus talked about the law of direct return all the time. Jesus said, look, if, if, you, if you're critical of others, then others are going to be critical of you. If you're friendly toward others, others are going to be friendly toward you. You've heard the, you've heard the scripture, uh, if a man would have friends, he must show himself friendly, right? Yeah, you've heard that and mentioned at funerals and so forth, and, and everybody there says, boy, this person was so great, and I, I love him to death. I, well, why can they say that? Well, it was because he was friendly toward them, and they're friendly in return. See, that's direct return. Today, in this beatitude, Jesus says, if you are merciful toward others, then others are going to be merciful toward you. So it's a direct return. So, here, so the point of this is, if I want to be happy, I'm going to have to treat people right. And what is right? Well, according to what Jesus says here, treating them right means treating them with mercy. So what is mercy? Well, mercy is, is compassion, or maybe another word, pity, shown toward uh, an, an offender, somebody who has offended you, or uh, an enemy. So when I have compassion, or I have pity toward someone who has offended me, or someone who is uh, fighting against me or, 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 or is it my enemy in some way, that is merciful. Mercy is one of the major attributes of God, by the way. And aren't we glad mercy is one of the major attributes of God? That God is merciful. Look at, look at Psalm 145. This just lists two or three things that are characteristics of God. Look at what David said. The Lord is gracious. That means he's full of grace. Grace gives us something we don't deserve, remember? We don't deserve to go to heaven when we die, do we? Because Romans 6.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace gives me heaven when I die, and I don't deserve heaven. My wages, what I've, wages are what you get paid for the work that you do. He says the what you ought to get paid for the work that you do is death. That means eternal death, separation from God forever. But God has, has, has grace for me because he gives me a gift that gives me something I don't deserve. Thank you, Jesus. So one of the major attributes of God is that God is merciful. Think of the verse in Hebrews chapter 4 when it says, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, then let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. 
What are we going to find at the throne of grace? And obviously it's great that it's the throne of grace and not the throne of judgment. He says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So it is God's mercy that keeps me from getting what I deserve. So mercy then is not just a feeling. Mercy is not just a thought. Mercy is an action. Mercy is, mercy. Is, you, if you can think about it, uh, love, you know, we say, I love you. Uh, 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 you're my friend. I love you, brother. Uh, God loves us. God says, I love you. What, what, is, what does that mean? Well, it, one of the things it means is uh, I'm merciful toward you. I, I have, I, it's not just an attitude or a feeling. It's an action. It's, it's actually doing something. And Jesus said, look, if, if you want to reflect me, I, I am merciful. If you want to reflect me, then you're going to need to be merciful too. So how do I know if I'm merciful? How do I know if I'm practicing mercy? The direct return, <laughs> what you give, you get. How do, I, how do I know I'm merciful? Well, let me give you four marks. I'm going to do them real quick. Four marks, four things in your life that will help you understand if you're merciful or not. Because it is important whether you are merciful, because if you're not merciful, you're not going to receive mercy. If you are merciful, you are going to receive mercy. And Jesus said, you know how, we, how you can be happy in life? Be merciful, because I'm merciful, like father, like son. You know? And here it is, number one. Uh, I, I know that I'm merciful. You can kind of you know, judge and evaluate yourself just a little bit on on how well you're doing with your mercy by looking at these. All right, number one, if I'm a merciful person, then I'm going to be patient with the peculiar. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. All right? <laughs> I hope he... Whew. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you, think about somebody in your life that's like this, and if you can't think of anybody, uh, you're probably it in somebody else's life. Yeah, you know, there's another old saying that uh, I came up with. I mean, I can't when I say it, I was brought up with in life. And the old saying is, in every, in every life, some rain must fall. That was the way of our expressing the fact that sometimes things don't work out like we think, and there are bad things that happen in everybody's life. And so the expression was, some, uh, in life, uh, so, in every life, some rain must fall. Well, I believe also this is true about peculiar people in our life. In everybody's life, some peculiar people must fall. And I know you have some, some, some peculiar people in your life, right? Yeah, I mean, people, they're a good egg, but they're a little bit cracked, you know, kind of thing. Uh, the lights are on, but no, nobody's home. Uh, their elevator doesn't quite extend to the top floor. You know, all kinds of little phrases we say about it. And, and if you can't think of anybody, don't point at them, all right? That's tacky. Don't, don't even do it. But, but, uh, but there are people like this in our life. Every one of us have some some peculiar people because we know we know all our lives are normal, right? We're all we're all normal, so there are some peculiar people that come into your life. Well, I'm just saying that all of these peculiar people give you a chance to be merciful in your life. And when somebody's peculiar in your life, that's an opportunity for you to be like God. What does the Bible say that we're supposed to do with these peculiar people in our life? And I know you know this because you've been in groups of people. You go to men's night. You go to women's night. You're there at prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. You're in small groups and different things and everywhere. And, and I know you've probably said within yourself, man, that person is whoop, something, you know, whack. I mean, that person has some odd things going on in life or, whoo, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of dangling over the edge. And, and you've felt this about people. All right, how do you handle these kind of people? What, what do you do with these kind of people in your life? Well, here's what one of the scriptures, 1 Thessalonians 5 says. Paul said, now we exhort you. We, we encourage you, brethren. Warn those who are unruly. And that just means lazy or complacent or rebellious. Warn them. You're not going to be like that. Comfort the faint-hearted. Faint-hearted here means timid or awkward. So we're supposed to comfort those who are, who are awkward, which is a good word for saying strange, right? 
unusual, uh, uh, not socially adept. Uh, they, 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 you know, they make you feel just a little bit uncomfortable. But we're supposed to comfort them, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. Well, let me ask you, are you patient with people like this? Are you patient with allowing them to be expressive without condemning them and criticizing them and shaming them? making them feel uncomfortable? Do you comfort people like this? Are you patient with all men? Well, how can you be patient with people like this? Well, I'll just give you one suggestion is learn their background. In other words, when somebody seems to be a little bit peculiar, most likely there's a reason for this, right? And if I will learn their background, just take a minute to learn. All right, this person's a little bit awkward, let me just kind of get with them a little bit, and let's, let me hear their backstory. Let me, let me hear what's going on. Hey, brother, what, share this with me, because I, there might be something that I need to know that will help me better understand you and be able to be used by God to minister to you rather than to condemn you. Once we begin to know somebody's backstory, we begin to look at them in a different way. We, instead of looking at them and saying, man, that brother has so far to go, we start looking at them and say, man, look how far they've come. We, we, we start looking and we, and we realize that behind their external awkwardness, that there's probably some pain underneath there. I mean, my goodness, uh, uh, peculiar behavior, behind peculiar behavior, there's, there's loneliness, there's depression, there's stress. Uh, maybe they, pe uh, what is it, PSTD, uh, post-traumatic PTSD? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe something there, uh, all kind of anxi anxieties, all kind of stresses, all kinds of thoughts and, and, and pressures. I mean, maybe that's what's causing this external awkwardness in this, in this peculiar life. So learn, learn some of their backstories. Look, here's what Romans says. So accept one another as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. What does that mean? Well, Jesus said merciful people are accepting people. By being an accepting person, you know what that means? I'm not quick to judge you. And Jesus said, look, if you want to be like me, when you get peculiar people in your life, and this is one of the reasons why we have small groups, by the way, one of the reasons why we try to break down the congregation into smaller little bite-sized groups is so we can learn about each other, so that we have an opportunity to be accepting toward people in our life that are just a little bit unusual. And Jesus said, uh, merciful people are accepting people, and they're not quick to judge. And so they realize that peculiar people might be hurting people, and hurting people usually hurt people. So are you merciful? All right, let's get another mark real quick, all right? Forgive those who have fallen. If I'm a merciful person, I will not only be patient with peculiar people, but I will be uh, forgiving toward those who have fallen. Now, by fallen, I mean people who are sinful, you know, people who have messed up their life, people that have ruined themselves, so to speak, and they might do it over and over again. To be a merciful person says, instead of rubbing it in, and by rubbing it in, I mean, I mean criticizing them. I mean, I mean, why do you keep doing the same stupid thing? Why, why, uh, I would never do that. Man, there must be something wrong. I mean, all these kind of feelings and statements and attitude. Do you, when somebody messes up their life or hurts, gets hurt in something, do you rub it in or do you rub it out? Uh, uh, when people let you down, do you hold it over the, their heads for the rest of their lives? You never let them off the hook? Well, that's not merciful. You see this especially in marriage. I, I, I do. I've of marriage counseled for all of my 45 years in the ministry. And one of the things I see often in marriage counseling situations is somebody did something 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And, and, and they've repented and they've asked for forgiveness and, and there's legitimate change in their life, but you won't let it go. You just keep bringing it up. You won't let it die. That's not mercy. Look, look at what the Bible says about, 
about forgiveness of those who have fallen and, and have come clean, that we're supposed to bear with one another, look at, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. The interesting thing about forgiveness is when, when, when we're called to receive it, oh man, that feels so right. Woo, thank God that there's mercy and, and I'm receiving. Woo, but when we're called to give it, it often feels so wrong. The, because the truth is, let's just admit it, we don't like to forgive people. Because we think if I forgive them, somehow I let them off the hook. Yeah, I mean, if I forgive them, that means that I'm not going to keep bringing it up. Uh, and I, how, are, how are they ever going to change if I don't keep putting pressure on them in life? Like, like your eternal mission is to fix people. That's God's job. That's not your job. You're not going to fix them anyway. All you can do is make people mad. God, God is the one who can fix things like this. And, and when you, quote, let them off the hook... Uh, that's, not, that's not your mission to keep them on the hook. It's God's mission to change their life. You may be saying, well, I, all I want is justice. That's what I'm looking for in life, Pastor. No, you don't want justice. You may think you want justice, but you don't want justice. What you want is mercy. It's like the lady that went to the photographer, and she took her pictures, and she took them in there and had them developed, and when she got the pictures back, she looked at them and she took them back to the photographer. She says, these pictures don't do me justice. The photographer looked at her and said, ma'am, you don't want justice. You want mercy. <laughs> <In> my... <laughs> yeah, you may think you want justice, but may I say to you, no, no, no. You want mercy. And, 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 and the, the fact is, if I'm merciful, I am going to give Mercy to the fallen is so much easier to criticize and point a finger than it is to sympathize and hold someone up and move someone along. So, all right, if I'm merciful, how do I know I'm merciful? Well, I'm merciful when these peculiar people enter my life. I'm patient with them, not quick to judge. And when somebody has fallen and hurts themselves, I don't rub it in. I, I rub it out. Here, here's a third, Mark. Uh, help those who are hurting all of us have hurting people in our life, right? All of us have people in our lives that are going through things, that are having challenges in life, and, and they're, they're hurting. Look, look at this verse. This is Proverbs 3.27. It says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Now, this is just talking about practical assistance. This is talking about when you have an opportunity to bless someone, when it's in the power of your hand to bless someone, when they deserve it, you need to bless them. Don't withhold good things from people's lives when they have earned the goodness that you should show them. So all I'm saying is what this verse is about is talking about practical assistance. Well, a part of mercy is practical assistance. When people, uh, when people are hurting all around us, what God says to us is, as a merciful person, uh, you need to open your eyes. And when you look at people that are hurting, just to sit there and feel sorry for them, well, that's not living like Christ. For me to, to pity them and to feel sorry for them and to... You know, say, oh, thank God that's not happening to me, and, and I feel so sorry for you. But no, no, no. no. Uh, uh, to be merciful according to what this verse says is that we need to do something about whatever it is that's hurting them in life. When it's in the power of our hands to do it, now we can't always do it because it's not always in the power of our hands. Sometimes we can't do a thing about it. Sometimes we can only sympathize or empathize. But there are many times when we can inject ourselves into a situation, offer assistance, help those that are hurting. And Jesus said, that's what mercy is all about. That's like Christ. Christ didn't just sit around and say, I'm sending you a note that says, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling for you in suffering times. 
Uh, Jesus did something about whatever he saw. And when we're like Jesus, that's what being merciful is. Look, look, look. This is a tough little couple of verses here. Boy, this is really convicting to me, actually. Terribly. Look at it in 1 John uh, 3, 17. But whoever has this world's goods, I know you don't think you have very much, but you do have a lot more than you think, I guarantee you. And if you count your many blessings, name them one by one. It'll surprise you what the Lord has done. That's the old hymn, right? Yeah, it will surprise you how good you have it and how blessed you are in this world's goods. It says if you have, if you have this world's good and you see a brother, everybody pat your neighbor and say, you're a brother. Yeah, yeah. In other words, he's talking about other Christians. He's talking about your brothers in Christ. He said, now, if you have this world's goods and you have a brother in Christ, now, this is not talking about all those poor people out in the world that are worldly and all of that. We know the world's full of them, and we know the Bible says the poor you will have with you always. So don't think that you're ever going to be without poor people, because you're not. And this is not talking about poor people out there in the world. This is talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. The people that you go to church with, the people that are in your men's group, the people that are in your women's group, the people that uh, come, to the, come to the Sunday fellowship. You know, I mean, this is your brother. And you see a brother in need and you shut your heart and, and, uh, and you shut up against him. How does the love of God abide in him? Was the question. Uh, how can you say the love of God is in you when you can look at your brother who's in need and you can just shut up your heart and say, well, that's just his tough luck. I'm not getting involved with that. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This is practical assistance. Right, action. But that's right, Bill. This is, this is mercy. This is action in life. I put in your notes that I gave out to you uh, a motto of life. This is John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, Methodism, Methodism whatever. The, method, the Methodist bunch, that bunch that we try to beat to the chicken house every Sunday, all right? <laughs> Them and the Presbyterians. John Wesley, it's a great quote. Look at what he said. He said, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as you possibly can. What's that all about? That's a, that, 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 that means uh, I'm going to help the hurting. So I'm, I'm patient with peculiar folks. I'm forgiving to the fallen people, and I'm helpful to those who are hurting. See, this is mercy. This is what happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This is what mercy really is. And let me give you the, what I think is probably the hardest one of all. This last one, do good to my enemies. Uh-oh. That one puts it, puts it on you, doesn't it? All right, I'm merciful. I, I can be patient with the peculiar, and I can be uh, forgiving to the fallen, and I can be helpful to those who hurt. Okay, I understand that, Pastor. But I do good to my enemies, really. I mean, this is real, you know, something that I'm supposed to do. My enemy who tries to hurt me, harm me, kill me, destroy me, uh, stab me in the back, do bad things against me. I'm, I'm, I'm somehow supposed to just look over that and not only, be, uh, not only be forgiving to them, but then also be nice. <laughs> That's hard, isn't it? It's easy to say, but have any of you ever tried this? This is a tough little pill right here. Look, look at the verse, Luke 6. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Somebody's nice to me, I'm nice to them. Okay, that's humanity. That's natural. You be nice to me, I'm going to be nice to you back. For even sinners do the same. You don't have to have Christ in your heart to be nice to people who are nice to you. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? You give them some money, you know they're going to pay you back. Okay, you hadn't done anything out of the ordinary. That's normal people. For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Okay. But love your enemies. Oh, do good and lend hoping for nothing in return. Oh, you, my enemy's hurting. My enemy's in need. And I say, here, brother, I know you're in need. And here's something I think might help you. And you think, I might not ever get that back again. They're not going to pay me back. 
Jesus said, do some of that and your reward will be great. Who's going to reward you? God says he is. I mean, do you really believe that God does stuff like that? Do you really believe? I mean, see, this is about your faith. It's, it's saying, do you have faith enough to believe God when he says, if you will be good to that stinking joker that's so bad to you, that he will reward you for doing good to those that don't like you? Do you believe? This is, this is whether you trust God or not. That's what this is. This is not, doesn't have anything to do with anything except God said it. Are you going to believe God? Do you have enough faith to believe that God is going to do that in your life? That's what this is all about. Uh, and, and you will be, the, be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. God is kind to the unthankful, which probably includes you. Because how unthankful are you? God's given you everything. God's given you blessings. The fact that you can sit in this sanctuary and can walk in and out and breathe and, and have enough motor skills and you're not hurting all the time and your spine's right and, and everything and you're not dying with migraines and you're not seeing flashes before your eyes and you're not whacked out with some kind of uh, post-traumatic stuff and you're full of anxieties and you, and, and, you know, uh, all, the fact that that is true about your life is something you ought to be thankful for. But are you thankful? Well, most times you're just grumbling about whatever it is that you think's wrong. So God says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm gracious to the unthankful. And we ought to say, glory to God, amen, because that's me most of the time. And I'm merciful to those that are evil. It means the people that were just like you before you came to Christ. How many of you, don't raise your hand. How many of you were evil? How many of you have ever been evil? Thinking up bad things to do, doing bad things, being spiteful, being rebellious, being self-centered, self-focused, hurting others, getting revenge. I mean, these are evil things. And I submit to you that before you came to Christ, hopefully not after you've come to Christ, but maybe after you've come to Christ, you've done evil things. God was merciful to you when you were evil. Matter of fact, if God wasn't merciful to us when we were evil, we'd all be crispy critters right now, right? I mean, when God, when, when I was at my worst, God was at his best. God still, when I was at my worst, God forgave me. He didn't wait till I got straightened out and flying right before he came in and challenged my soul to be saved. When I was at my sorriest, God was at his best. Therefore, verse 36, be merciful just as your father is also merciful. That means like father, like son. Do you want to be like God? Here's how. Be merciful. You do good to those who do evil to you. Of course, that's the exact opposite of what society says that we should do. Society says when somebody hurts you, hurt them back. Get even with them. Don't let them get away with that. Don't let them do that to you. And if you can get them without them knowing that it was you that got them, so much the better. Gossip about them. Turn them into the IRS. Pray that they have a stroke. God, God pour hot grease on them. I mean, you know, uh, get the wrath all. God says, no, that's reacting. What I want you to do is choose an action. Forgive not only forgive them, but be nice to them. That's, we wear these cute little braces, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's what Jesus would do. That's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do, right? Let me give you a little assignment. Go to work tomorrow, or go to school tomorrow, and somebody's going to be a jerk to you. There are lots of jerks out there, right? All right, somebody's going to be a jerk to you. Here's your assignment. Be nice to them. When they're being a jerk to you, you be nice to them. And when they're putting you down, you, you build them up. 
Look for something to compliment. Look for something to be positive about. Look for some way to build them up while they're putting you down. What will they think about this? They'll, be, they'll, they'll probably think, uh, come in earth, you know, twilight zone, what in the world's going on? You'll blow their mind in the first place because they won't know how to react to that because that's not the way the world thinks about th- uh, things. But, but, I, but, but when they respond bad, you just keep doing good with them and, um, and, and, and they're not going to be able to handle it all together. So the question is, uh, why would I do this? Why, why, what, what kind of assignment is this, Pastor? Well, uh, why should I do this? Well, because, and this is going to sound corny. It really is. It's going to sound corny as can be. But the best way to eliminate an enemy is to make a friend out of them. Now, I know that sounds corny, but what, what are the choices do you have? You going to kill them? Is that what you're going to do? Are you, are you going to guard your back for the rest of your life? Because you know they're going to come back time after time after time try to stick a knife in your back, right? All right, so your choices are kill them or guard your back for the rest of your life or let's try to turn this thing around and, and instead of them being my enemy, let's see if I can develop them into a friend. And when I respond this way, I quit being a reactor, I quit being on defense, and I start being on offense. And that's like God. So being patient with people who are peculiar, which we all have in our life, forgiving those that have fallen, helping those that are hurting, and doing good to my enemies, those are all marks of mercy in my life. How, how, good, how good did you do? Did you do good with it? How merciful are you? Uh, how full of mercy. Because remember, he said, if you give it, you get it. If you don't give it, you don't get it, right? And all of us need mercy. All right, these are, this is really terrible, uh, and it's hard to do, so I'm going to need powerful motivators in my life to motivate me to do this, right? All right, uh, let me give it, and then y'all, I, I know what time it is. Let me just give you these real quick. All right, number one, why should I do this? Number one, because God has shown mercy to me. All right, you say, why should I be merciful? Well, it's because God has shown mercy to me. And he's shown a lot of mercy to me. And God said, look, I, I'm gonna, one of the reasons why you ought to be uh, merciful to others is because I have been merciful to you. You remember in the book of John chapter 8, there was a woman who was caught in adultery. And they brought her out to Jesus out there in the public. And and they said to Jesus, they said, look, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. And you know what the law says? The law says, Jesus, that we're supposed to stone her to death. And Jesus said, you know, you're right about that. And I'll tell you what, let's do this. The very, we're we're going to stone her to death because the law says that's what we're supposed to do. So here's what we're going to do. The first one of you that has never violated the law, you just step right up here and cast the first stone. And what does the Bible say? Pretty soon it was a ghost town. Pretty soon it was just the woman and Jesus. And Jesus looked at her and Jesus said, "Um, where are your accusers? And she said, I guess I don't have any in he said, all right, I'm not going to condemn you either. Just go and change your lifestyle. Sin no more. Don't let this be a part of your lifestyle. See, see that's how that G- Jesus forgives. Another time in Matthew chapter 7, he said, look, before you try to pick the speck out of somebody else's eye, why don't you get the telephone pole out of your eye? I mean, there's really no contest, is there? God has been merciful to me. Have you noticed that we try to judge others by their worst faults and we try to judge ourselves by our best intentions? God says, all right, give them a break because I've given you a break. Here's the second motivation. Let me get me going. I'm going to need more grace in the future. <laughs> not only have I gotten it in the past, I'm going to need some more of it unless I plan not to sin up to the day I die. Yeah, I need more mercy. I'm going to need more mercy in the future. I not only needed it in the past, I'm going to need more of it in the future. And so I need to be merciful because I know that I can't live perfectly for the rest of my life. And like James, the book of James said, James says the man who makes no allowances for others will find no allowances made for him. You say, Pastor Keith, my goodness, you don't know how bad they've hurt me. 
I just can't forgive them. Well, all I can say to you is, well, I hope you don't sin in the rest of your life because you're going to, mercy and forgiveness are, are, the, are, are like a two-way bridge that you're going to have to walk over to get to God. And you're going to need to walk over that thing, so don't burn that bridge. Look at what Mark 11. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Whoo! How about that? And in the model prayer, you, we, we say it all the time. When Jesus' disciple says, teach us to pray, and he said, all right, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which is in heaven, uh, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do you know what we just prayed? Lord, just like I forgive people that have trespassed against me, I want you to forgive me. So unless you plan to be perfect for the rest of your life, you're going to need some more mercy in the future. And God said, if you give it, you get it. If you don't give it, you don't get it. I know that's pretty tough. Let me, here's the third one. I should be merciful because it makes me happy. Yeah. I mean, the Beatitude says, uh, you want to be happy, then you're going to need to be merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That means, blessed are those you want to be happy, you're going to have to give mercy, because the opposite of that is true. Also, if you give mercy, you're going to be happy. If you don't give mercy, you're going to be unhappy. And you know what I found in life? The most unhappy people that I find in life are those people that are resentful and those people that are, that are holding a grudge against people. And those people that are uh, allowing others to think, to, to control their thoughts by uh, encouraging me to not let something go and how am I going to get them back and what am I going to do and if I could just get to it. Those are the most unhappy people in life. And so why should I be merciful? Because the fifth of eight steps to happiness says if I want to be happy, I need to let them off the hook. I need to show mercy. And when I show mercy, this takes the focus off of me and puts it on someone else. And when the focus gets off of me, the pressure and stress in my life go down and my happiness goes up and I can be happy in life. You know, there are a lot of people in life today that are depressed, you know, that have anxieties and you're some of you are on medication and some of you have all kinds of ways of trying to handle stress, anxiety, depression, and all that kind of stuff. Let me give you just one little prescription that I found in my life to be very helpful to me. And that is, if I want to release some of that pressure off of my life, here's what I need to do. I need to start being patient with people that are peculiar in my life. Don't be so quick on the trigger. Don't look at people's external awkwardness. Be patient with them. Start showing some forgiveness to people that haven't risen to your level of perfection. People mess up. People make mistakes. People do what they said they would never do. How about a little compassion? A little forgiveness? How about... How about quit, quit judging so quickly on things? And when you, people all around you are hurting, don't, don't shut up your heart against them. Look at them and, and, and see, is there something that I can do to be of help to them? They're hurting. This is a brother. This is a sister in the Lord. Can I take the focus off of me and look for somebody else to be a blessing to? That'll, that'll help that cloud of depression lift off of you. And I'm going to do good to those who are persecuting me. Well, that, that, that's a good prescription for having depression and, and stress and anxiety and tension and all that kind of stuff. Because as you give mercy, you receive happiness in life. That's what this, that's what this beatitude says. So bow your head. Right now.